Hey everybody, on today's show is my friend, Dr. Katya Walters-Knight. I've known Dr. C for a long time and that's because she took her time in booking her retreat at Imaloa. Uh, for me though, that means that Katya is deliberate, she's intentional and she's so detailed in what she wants to create for her gatherings and the experiences that she curates. Um, and I'm really excited for you all to meet and learn more about her if you don't already know about her. Uh, Katya says she loves humanity and she's committed to justice and equality. She's a supporter of the human potential to care for and heal ourselves. She's a proud Jamaican immigrant with East and West Coast roots. She's a mom, a grandmother, and a sister to a vibrant family. I love that intro. She's also uh, a licensed clinical psychologist, you know, down to the brass tacks, Katya, whose practice focuses on those living with depression, anxiety, identity challenges, and trauma and abuse. It's a lot, Dr. C. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thanks for um, inviting me and having me on. It's quite- Appreciate being here. I, I, I love that you're here, and it's quite a life path that you've- chosen for yourself? Did you choose it or did it choose you? It actually chose me. Believe it or not, I went from math to pre-med, back to math, to I have no idea what I want to do. But what happened is along the way, over time, it seems like it didn't matter what job, what role I was in. Even in school, people tend to gravitate towards me asking for support around something including strangers, right? And I always found myself in positions of giving support, you know, lending a helping hand. Um, and so eventually, uh, interestingly enough, when I took my first psychology class, I hated it. Um, we were studying Freud. And I remember getting out of that class. I'm like, this is a load of crap. And I am not, I don't know if I can say crap on here. You but can say whatever you want. <laughs> What, what what caused you what caused you to think it was a load of crap? I'm curious because the there were uh, there were some piece. yeah there were some therapists that probably agree with you. Yeah, it was yeah. just you know there was so much emphasis on the mom and the everything was you know very sexual and you know at least the class I was taking and it felt very just weird and odd and I didn't agree with a lot of what was being said. So fast forward years later, and this is how the East Coast, West Coast um, comes in. I left Jamaica, moved to the East Coast where my dad was, was there for a very brief period of time. Didn't work for me, you know, in terms of how I am and how I want to walk through the world. And so I left after about a year and a half, half in the East and moved to California. And one of my first jobs was with a company called United Communities for Human Rights. And that was kind of my intro, my formal intro into the work of just being an advocate. And so what we did was we work with organizations such as Bay Area Women Against Rape. Um, so at one point I was doing like supportive, not just um, counseling, but uh, courtroom support, hospital support for women who were sexually assaulted. Um, we also did a lot of work for different um, women shelters for women who were in, now we call it intimate partner abuse. Back then we called it battered women shelters. And so we did a lot of fundraising, a lot of outreach for places like that. And I realized that that was my passion. Right. And so, but I, I, let me digress a little and go back to just historically growing up in Jamaica, you know, I grew up with five siblings and my mom, and I was kind of, quote unquote, the rebel, right? Because I had strong opinions about certain things. My first debate in high school, I was, I think, 11. Yeah, 10 or 11. When you I was first debated, before. you debated yes. like a debate team. Yes. You As were 11? debate. Yes. And the topic was a woman's place is in the kitchen. So, of course, I got very hot under the collar. <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah, at, 11. <laughs> at 11. What did you believe at 11? Like, what was your what was your worldview living in Jamaica? You grew up there from you were born I there. Grew yes, up there. I was born there. So what was the I worldview at, ele 16. at 11? What was the worldview that I'm so curious that the world is my oyster, uh -huh. right? That as a young woman, 
I can do and achieve whatever I set out to achieve. At 11, right? you understood this and believed as, this? At 11, I understood this and I believed it very strongly. Wow. And a part, I can't take full credit for that. I do have to give a lot of credit to my mom. I was going to say, what an amazing parent. Was, yes, she was absolutely phenomenal. And my siblings. You know, I had, you know, two older brothers, one older sister, a younger brother and a younger sister that I grew up with. Since then, I've had, you know, two other siblings, but those were the ones I grew up with. And there was such a belief in me and in just who I was and am as a person and just how I navigated the world that it made it easy. It made it very easy for me to believe that I can achieve whatever I set my mind to and whatever I wanted to do. And mom was extremely supportive as were my siblings. You know, I, um, I have to share this very personal story. Um, I ran track. And so just so you know, I'm very competitive. <laughs> At least I used to be, still am on some levels. I've just matured a little. And when young girls were reading you know, Bob's the Twin and Harlequin romances. I was reading Nancy Drew and The Heart of Boys. And my goal was I can outrun you as a boy. I can outkick a soccer ball. I don't care how old you are as a guy. I can outdo anything you said you can do. So I did not subscribe to the whole gender norms. Again, a part of that I think was my mom's doing because she divided the work amongst all the siblings, male or female, it didn't matter. You all get to clean the toilet. You all get to sweep the yard, regardless of what gender you are. And so for me, I ran sport. I did track. I played every single sport under the sun. I was very athletic. But the thing that stood out for me the most and what I think also contributed just to my, um, my resiliency and the strength and the just belief that I can is having that foundation um, of support this community of support um, with my family, with my siblings. Um, I can specifically remember times where back then, you know, we didn't have as much, what should I call it, vehicles on the road, you know? So there's a bus that picks you up as students um, in the morning. And then there was a, a uh, Mr. Fred, we call him Mr. Fred, who had his own personal transport, who would come to get us if we miss the bus. Um, and in the evenings, if you miss the main bus to go home, let's just say you're screwed, right? <laughs> of course, I ran track. I played sports, which means 99.99% of the time, guess who missed the bus? I Katia would. did, yeah. I Mr. Did, Mr. Fred you know? was nowhere to be found. <laughs> Mr. Fred was gone. The main bus was gone. Um, but I did have a handful of classmates who, for whatever reasons, I don't know why they were still there, but they were there, you know, whether it's intentional waiting for me or they just missed their opportunity to get on one of the buses. Um, so there was usually a group of us, always the same group, which I am really thankful for because they became really great friends and we would walk. And I tell my kids a lot. I said, you guys have it so easy. Where I went to school, we would walk over 10 miles to get home. Oh, it was fun, though. As kids, it was fun because in Jamaica, there's fruit trees lying on the streets. So you had fun. You were picking mangoes. You were eating, you know, sweet stuff. You know, you're eating along the way, right? Whatever wow. fruit. And sometimes you get lucky, you know, some driver would take pity on us and they'll stop and we'd all run and jump in and, you know, get transported a little closer to our destination. But the thing, two things I want to point out that would happen on failing. One is halfway point, my oldest brother, who, by the way, just left here, <laughs> he was just stopped by my house. For whatever reason, he always knew when I was going to be late. You know, remember back then we didn't have cell phones and all those things, right? And there was always a hot meal waiting for me at the halfway point. So I would get sustenance and oh. then would keep walking. And the last leg of the journey, I was never afraid because I know once I turn on a particular street, I will see legs coming down. It's dark. You know, because some areas, the street lights are either out or there's no street light. 
but there will always be at least four bodies walking towards us. And that would be my mom and my siblings. You know, it didn't, it's funny how you think about things and you don't really pay much attention until later. And it dawned on me that of the group of us, not one of the ladies, I went to an all-girls school, not one of the ladies that was walking with me, parents, siblings, ever came looking for them. Ever. Mm. It was always my mom, brother, sister, or both sisters, my mom, one or two brothers, always. You know, and I, I look back on that and how it shaped just kind of, you know, how I see the world, you know, and I talk a lot about how we connect with others, right? And beginning with how we connect with ourselves. And I realized that that had a lot to do with how I learned to connect with folks because it created, you know, this, this already bond of safety that I know what to look for in the world right? There was an attachment bond that was healthy, right? So when it came time to make and form relationships, it wasn't that hard right? wow. because I had, I had that, you know, and I, I, yeah. So I am such a big believer that when you can hear someone else's story authentically, it's like, as you were speaking and talking, I don't know if anybody who's listening felt this way, but I felt a sense of nostalgia for what I myself mm -hmm. never experienced just by living in your shoes for a moment. That was such a beautifully detailed kind of invitation into your life as a kid and how it started to shape your worldview beyond just that debate class at 11. Mm -hmm. about why a woman's place is in the kitchen or whatever it was. Oh uh, yeah, that was the yeah. But I'm mm -hmm. but that but the broader picture I so appreciate you sharing that. You're such a great storyteller. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah, truly. I wonder if we link that back to your retreat, Dr. C, you say that mm -hmm. healing uh, is is a journey that isn't about control. Yet so mm -hmm. many of us who are reconciling our pasts and resentments that we may still hold, all we want to do is control them. Or I'll speak mm -hmm. for myself, all I've wanted to do is control them. And I'm sure people feel similarly. How do you teach people how to navigate this without us trying to have control over the past? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, a couple different ways. But the biggest way, and I'll, I'll start off broad, is that the past is gone right? We can't go back and change it. This is not back to the future with Michael J. Fox, right? So we can't go back and, and redo that. What we have to understand is that, yes, it did happen and it has shaped who we are today, right? What we have, and I use the word control very loosely, right? What we have control over right now is how we do. What are the choices we're making now? right? How are these choices serving me today? How will this serve me tomorrow? All right? But one of the things when I talk about that, I always want to make sure people understand is that when we recognize that this has happened, we also need to recognize that there are going to be things that, you know, that's it's the root. It's the root of our suffering. There are all these things that says, Jake, this is why you um, like to read, you know, or this is why you engage in these self-destructive behaviors, right? The thing to keep in mind is that until we recognize that the past is the past and we choose to not live with regrets and we choose to say, yes, it did happen. I can't change it. It is the cause of some of it's it's the root of some of my suffering but i am here now and somehow i survive how did i get here what are my strengths what are the things that got me here right if we can focus on those things and say okay how can i then build on these things so that tomorrow looks different mm. right because at the end of the day right 
as I said, we can change the past, but we can learn from it. We can learn from those experiences, right? We can say, okay, I heard this, I experienced this, I lived this, I felt this. And when these things happen, this is how it showed up in my body. This is the story I told myself about that, mm. right? These are the behaviors I've been doing because of the story that I'm telling myself or because of what I'm feeling in my body. Now, how is that working for me right now in this moment? Mm, it's not, right? And if it's not working for me, then what is within my control? What can I do differently so that my tomorrow can and will look differently, all right? So one of the saying I always tell folks, I said, you know, who we are yesterday is not who we are today, right? And who we are today is not who we'll be tomorrow because we can make choices in this moment to shape what my tomorrow looks like Right? I cannot make choices today that's going to change my past, but I can make choices today based on what I want tomorrow to look like. And if I'm able to do that, I need to be able to do that with compassion. Right? Mm -hmm. So not the, you know, we, we all grow up with the, oh, suck it up, get over it. It's been seven days. It's been 10 years. Why are you still belly aching? Right? And we do that as a way to move us forward. But the thing to understand, you know, when we're hurt, when we have been hurt, when we have had traumatic experiences, right, by using those words, all we're doing is triggering that part of our brain that's ready for a fight. Mm. Well, right? this is this is interesting because this is part of your work as well. You talk about removing this language like my trauma. And yet, mm -hmm. Katya, it seems to be rampant in the retreat world to talk about one's trauma or even in the wellness world. Like everyone's going around about how traumatized they are. And I don't mm -hmm. know if people really recognize what they're saying or I, I don't know if they're fully present with the impact of what it is they're saying. How has this word and concept infiltrated language over the last 10 years in your practice? Were mm -hmm. you seeing language like this used in your early days of practice? And how does it impact those who have actually been traumatized? Um, I don't know if the word trauma was so present years ago. The idea and the concept of trauma was all, it's always been present, right? But I think oftentimes when people, back then, when people think of trauma, you know, now we're distinguishing. We say there's big T traumas and small T traumas. Right. And so I would say that's what therapists ago, are doing or that's what you're doing or what's the who's making that distinction? I think uh, therapists are doing that more okay. so now. I'm definitely doing that. And I think some, you know, other folks who work in the trauma field are trying to make that distinction. What is For the me, big T versus the little T? Right. So the big T is kind of things that people traditionally know as trauma, sexual assault, um, homicides, you know, things like that things that affects the body, right? That people are willing to talk about. Yeah, I was raped, I was, you know, shot at, or I was shot, you know, things like that. Small T, as I look at them, small T traumas are things that we don't necessarily think about. Grief, uh, divorce, um, your kid going off to college, um, a miscarriage, um, job loss, retirement, getting married getting divorced, you know, having a baby. So even the things that can bring on one hand joy could also be seen, can be triggering for some people, right? And so what I've chosen to do is to step away from the word trauma and talk about traumatic experiences, right? Because I feel that Again, what might seem to be a pleasurable moment, for example, giving birth for a lot of women is a wonderful thing to bring, you know, a child into this world, yet the experience can be traumatic, right, based on what is happening, right? Um, hmm. Why do people cry when they get married, you know, you know, things like that. It's trauma right? I'm not willing to experience, Katya. <laughs> I just don't think I'm fit for that little T trauma. 
but but it's funny because we all, unfortunately, we've all had and will continue to have traumatic experiences. Here's the difference, and this goes back to what you were asking or you you started to say though, is yeah. how I allow those experiences to take form makes the difference, right? So if I allow these experiences to continue to be in, in the driver's seat, then I have a problem. It's going to become problematic. However, if I'm able to say, you know what, this did happen. Here's how it showed up. Here's how it's continuing to show up in my life. And you know what, I'm done with giving my power away. I'm done renting space in my head to these experiences that are no longer serving me, mm. right? And if it's no longer, if you know, if it's no longer serving me, it has not served me, meaning the way I'm dealing with it, not the experience itself, but how I'm dealing with it, how I'm navigating it, then I need to change. Mm. I need to change my behavior. I need to change my storyline, right? Mm. Because the experience is real, right? It's what we do with that. That's the key. Yeah, I think it's important to acknowledge the reality of the experience. And yet mm -hmm. I, I and yet I sense that when people are running around talking about their trauma, I do like the distinction of little t trauma and big t trauma. But when people mm -hmm. are running around about it, what you know, the, the the dog ate their homework kind of trauma. It's hard, at least for me, maybe not for you as a therapist, it's hard for me to like mm -hmm. validate that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because it feels so frivolous when people are out there really going through stuff, but yet mm -hmm. who am I to judge? I just think we've got to be so intentional with the words that we're using so that we can actually mm -hmm. communicate what we're really feeling and what we actually want to be communicating. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Well, yes, yes. And I will say, and even though, you know, for you or for me, oh, the dog ate his homework is like... I know. Whatever. Right. right? Yeah. For that person, that experience is real. I know. Right. And that experience of the dog eating the homework could trigger something that happened before. The last time my dog ate my homework, I, my dad beat the crap out of me or I got in so much trouble at school or right. And so it could it could be that there's other unresolved issues that this triggered. I thought that right. immediately when I said it, I was like, that's so limiting because for someone else that mm -hmm. could be, so that's why you're the therapist. Uh, and I'm just the, <laughs> I'm just the guy at the Institute saying, come and explore. Um, because I'm not sure, I guess maybe I'm not sure how to articulate what I'm saying, or maybe I'm not being understood, but it's like, it's the frivolity of talking about everything as a trauma or triggering when in mm -hmm. reality, it's just normal life. It's like, you're just mm -hmm. experiencing normal life like that is mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. it's just part right. of life so so how so let me see if i can help with that because maybe one of the ways to look at it how i try to talk about certain experiences is that everybody's experience is real right your feelings are always valid no matter what it is those emotions those feelings are valid the issue is what you choose to do with that right so if i choose to you know, take, allow my emotions to take me down that destructive path that becomes problematic. And I think that's what human nature reacts to. It's like, uh, well, why are you, mm. you, right? You're, you're, how is you, you drinking that bottle of Hennessy? How's that fixing the mm. dog ate your homework? Right? And also, so to, hum and to that point as well, like our own addiction to emotions, perhaps that's what I'm getting to is that people talk about being triggered or trauma. Mm -hmm. But And while the experience is real for them, the attachment or the addiction to the emotion that that causes and like, mm -hmm. anyways, I'm going down a slippery slope and I realize- No, 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 you're fine. It's a conversation, right? It is. I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to understand it and also trying to judge others less in my life because mm -hmm. I, I guess I realize in conversations like these, maybe I feel a little sensitive because I know that you have this great, big, huge cloak of compassion and understanding because that's what you do. And here I am like really thinking about what the hell are they talking about their trauma or what are they talking about? Da, da, da. Like, come on, I'll show you trauma. My trauma is bigger than your, but then I realized that's the same addiction to emotion that I'm talking about, like needing to prove or needing to, rather than just, I guess, being with what is recognizing that the there past is in the past. 
Yeah. And, and, and look at it this way that there's multiple realities, right? To any one experience. There's your reality. There's mine. There's Vanessa. There's whoever else is listening, <laughs> right? We all have all realities about the exact same thing, which is why if you think about it, you know, you can have an incident at the bank. Someone came in, you know, there's a robbery and everyone in the bank has a totally different experience. You know, some people are able to go back to work the next day, some within two, some a year later, they still are not able to go back because of the, when I talk about multi-realities, I'm talking about the story, the meaning Mm. I attach to being robbed, right? So earlier when I was talking about my life experience growing up, you know, what I neglected to say is that what developed from those experiences from having that family is a a schema, these longstanding views we have of ourselves and of the world, right? So if I have a strong schema because of my attachment, my strong, stable attachment, right? Someone who walks in, my reaction may be different from your reaction if your foundation, if your sense of self is not as strong, right? So when we talk about, you know, multiple realities, we're talking about understanding that my experience is just as valid as yours, right? It's just as valid. That doesn't mean you have to agree with it, right? That doesn't even mean you have to like it, but we have to understand that everybody's reaction or reality is valid for them. Mm. We can be, you know, we can say, well, why are they continuing to do X, Y, and Z? Because we're looking at it from our experience and from our lens. And my lens says, yes, but if that happened, why yada, yada, yada? But that's my lens. Mm -hmm. Right? Right? Hmm. That's not the other person's lens. And so when they're looking at things through their lens, they're seeing it based on their lived experience, right? And their lived experience says, this is scary. I should run. I should hide under the couch. I should do whatever to protect me. That's what they're looking at. You're looking at it or I'm looking at it from, okay, so this person is such and such. They're doing this. What do I need to do to take care of myself right now and move on? Mm. Mm. Right? It's important. It's important to cultivate this compassion and empathy. I'm curious, mm-hmm. outside of your formal education, who or what has most inspired the work that you're doing in retreats with couples and individuals? Uh, you know, the, the interesting thing about with the retreat, because I started off the women's retreat mainly because I did a, I ran a black women's sport group for years. And one of the young ladies um, in the group kept insisting, like, you should do a retreat. You should do a retreat. And for years, she kept hounding me, hounding me. But, you know, as you said earlier, Jake, nothing happens before it's time. And I don't move until I think. (laughs) And I'm going to raise my hand and say guilty as charged for hounding the hell out of you to host it in Maloa. Mostly because I was, I was so inspired by your work, but I think it was two years more or less, something like that. And I thought at one point, I just thought she's not hosting here. And then you called me and you're like, okay, I'm ready. And I was like, what? (laughs) <laughs> yes. Well, so that's kind of, so it's kind of the same storyline. You know, she suggested that she's, she was a travel agent and she had proposed, you know, you should do something on a cruise. I'm like, mm, that's not the niche, you know, that's not kind of what I'm looking for. Um, and she kept bugging me. It's like ever so often I get an email pop up, doc, when are you going to do a retreat? And then one year I'm like, okay, I'm ready, but I don't want to do it on a cruise. Here's what I envision, right? So honestly, I think she was the inspiration behind me doing a retreat. And then the rest of that came from me thinking about, okay, who do I want to serve in this retreat and why? And so what came from that is one of the things I've learned over the years is that especially for Black women, we are very, we're not very good at taking care of ourselves. We're great in taking care of everyone else right? But not as good at taking care of herself. And so I pretty much decided, okay, that's the group I want to focus on. 
And this is what I want that to look like. And from there, I developed the Black Women's Wellness Retreat in Jamaica because I also wanted to be away, far away, enough away so that they're not bombarded by family, friends, you know, um, things like that. And with the couples retreat, that also just came out of just the work I did with couples and realizing that there's, I like to break the mold. I like to think outside the box. And so for me, the couples retreat is structured totally different. It really is a lot of hands-on, um, you know, kind of getting couples to engage in things that they wouldn't necessarily think about doing. So being playful, cooking together, you know, things like that, um, that, you know, helps them to be, you know, to tap into all the different senses and kind of force them to talk to each other in a good way. Um, How fun is that? Fun. I don't think we've ever had anybody that has done, well, certainly not a couple's retreat in the way you're talking about, but to come and mm -hmm. cook together at Imaloa. Mm -hmm. I kind of love that. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that idea. <laughs> and it's funny because when I first checked out Imaloa, I remember, I, I don't know if you remember, I checked it out mainly for a couple's retreat, you know, um, and then I'm like, ooh, this is beautiful space for something about navigating one's trauma or traumatic experiences because of the setup. Still good for couples, and I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. Yeah. But I think the setting is so peaceful that I think, you know, um, working with any kind of experiences, traumatic experiences, that's a beautiful. I mean, setting. even even Just cooking together, even cooking together on a on a trauma or you know, retreat as well. That sounds, I just love the idea of cooking together at a retreat. Mm -hmm. I guess that's, mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I love this. Um, so if you're listening, I'm just curious, are you wanting to deal once and for all with your feelings of guilt and shame, or perhaps you're really wanting to let go of self-limiting beliefs? What do you imagine that your life could be like with this level of support and intentional gathering like Dr. Katya's? Katya, I want to ask if you can paint a picture of the five days that you'll mm -hmm. be at Imaloa um, and kind of thinking through the lens of what people can gain or what people will gain experience and learn. Can you kind of mm -hmm. give me a sense of the daily flow of the retreat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So overall, the what I want people to walk away with is just really understanding, you know, how they can understand and navigate their emotions, use it through the lens of compassion. So the foundation of the entire retreat is really about getting out of our emotional minds into our wise mind, but using that lens of compassion, right? So how do I find peace? How do I find the whole me, not just a part of me, how do I connect with the entire me using compassion? So some of the things that I'm hoping people will learn is, you know, through com using compassion, journaling, movement, how to be in your body, right? Because we tend to live a lot up here and we know that when we're in our head, these stories that we create for ourselves gets bigger and bigger and not in a good way. Right. Because it's going to tap into all the the fears, you know, all our negative um, thoughts that, that we have about ourselves. Right. So one of the things I definitely want people to understand or to learn is how to use not just compassion. Right. But journaling. So we'll have days where we'll have you'll journal. We'll have movement, whether it's through yoga, dance. You know, we'll have mindfulness practices. And most importantly, along with compassion, is that element that we run from, which is forgiveness. Hmm. Right? How do we forgive ourselves as a way to manage those painful experiences? So, what you were asking earlier, Jake, in terms of, you know, for a lot of people, they get stuck in that past experience of the pain, of the hurt of the trauma, of the grief, right? How can we forgive ourselves to let go of that? So rather than like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm still here, right? How do we say, you know what? I am here. It's okay to be here. Mm. Now what? 
So who am I? When am I? Where am I? How do I move past? How do I move through my traumatic experiences? How do I begin to heal? How do I begin to navigate these experiences so that I come up on the other side whole? All right. And that's the idea. So creating community. How can I do that through community? So making these connections. How do I make friends with my emotions, regardless of what they are? Because they're all there for a reason. As I said earlier, they're valid. They're there for a reason. They're telling me something. So how do I listen to that emotion, make friends with it, right? So that when I walk away, I'm walking away more whole because I'm embracing everything, the good, the bad, the ugly. All my experiences made me who I am today. All right. And I love me for being here today, regardless of my experiences. And because I love me, I want to make choices that's going to serve me tomorrow. All right. So again, compassion, compassionate tone, compassionate behavior. Understanding that compassionate behavior means you have to hold yourself accountable. It doesn't mean just, oh, be kind and sweet. It also means you're wrong, mm -hmm. right? But doing it and saying it in a way where I'm kind to myself, right? I'm forgiving myself for allowing this hurt to linger as long as it did. All right. Mm -hmm. And releasing and basically saying no regrets. I have no regrets because the choices I made back then worked based on my experience, based on what information I had. So when I forgive myself, I'm saying I'm releasing and I'm letting go. The hurt, the pain, the choices that no longer serves me today. Okay. Thank you, Katya. Before we go, I just want to acknowledge that I did not know how many times the idea and the word and the idea of compassion was going to come up and what you hope people gain experience and learn. Mm -hmm. And when I think about earlier in the conversation, when we were talking about trauma and I'm traumatized and I was really having a challenging time here, or I have a challenging time hearing people who identify as being traumatized uh you know we when we were talking about it i recognize that your work is all about others being able to be more compassionate to themselves and others and that because you hold that space this is just what's true for me in this conversation mm -hmm. because you hold that space and because that becomes an intention in a conversation or a retreat like you're hosting at imaloa Anything that comes up or anything that needs to be cleared in order to fulfill this intention of compassion will come up. And so now I recognize because of how you show up from this compassionate space, stuff comes up for others, like for me, mm -hmm. that has to be cleared in order to arrive at the compassion and the forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just got a glimmer and I wanted to share with those that are listening and also to thank you so much because... I got a glimmer of like, oh, this is, this is what it's about. This is the space you're holding. I can imagine that that's going to be the impact of the retreat. People coming on the retreat who have a desire to practice more compassion to themselves or to others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything's going to come up to be cleared in that pursuit. People don't realize that when they set an intention of, I want to make a million dollars. I want to do this. I want to have this. Everything comes up to be cleared in that pursuit. And so yeah, I guess a few things just came up for me. And that's great because that's what, a, you know, that's a conversation. All possibility lives in a conversation. So I appreciate you having one with me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And, and that is the, that's compassion, yeah. right? It involves wisdom, right? Yeah. One of the first elements of compassion is wisdom, right? To know what's happening and to make peace with what has happened, right? And choices moving forward. 
And that's forgiveness also. Mm. Right? And understanding that we cannot have healthy connections with others until we have a healthy connection with ourselves, right? So part of even with the retreat is about really how how do I, how can I show up as effective, not just for myself, but with others through communication, healthy communication, right? How do I create those things? But it does, be, it, do be, it, it does begin with self, right? It begins with self. It begins with me understanding that I'm showing up this way because, right? And it's okay. I don't need to beat myself up for that. I just need to make a decision, make a choice. Do I want to continue to, you know, navigate the world this way? Or do I want to, I'm at the crossroad. Do I want to go right? Right? Because I've been going left for a long time and it no longer serves me. It did. And that's why compassion is good because we don't want to beat ourselves up. We just need to say, now's time for a different choice. I love me. I love who I am. I love where I'm at and not, but, and I still have work to do. And that's compassion holding me accountable that there's still work that needs to be done. Beautiful. If you want more information on Katya's retreat, you can go to imaloainstitute.com slash Katya, C-A-T-H-I-A. Dr. Katya Walters Knight has her retreat at Imaloa. February 29th to March 5th, 2024. Only a few months away, Katya. It's going to be great to have you there. Yes, yes. I'm excited. I'm excited. Yeah. And I love it. I love how you kind of wrap this up there because I think that when people choose to come on a retreat, when that deposit is made or whatever it is, that's really when the retreat starts. It's not on the Mm -hmm. first day of the retreat, February 29th, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's the day that people commit. So tickets, speaking of tickets, Tickets start at 3900 and you get one session with Dr. C if you book and pay in full by August 1st, 2023. That's pretty cool. That's nice, Katya. I like that. Yes, yes. V- visit imaloainstitute.com slash Katya to learn more. My sincerest thanks to you. Thank you so much for taking time. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. And I'm excited and I look forward to February of 2024. <laughs> Or <laughs> finally, <laughs> I think it'll be five years in the making or four years in the making by that time. Yeah, yeah it was pre-COVID, so it's been a while. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a while. Well but worth the wait. nothing happens before it's time. And yes, well worth the wait. Happened. Yeah, yes. that's good. Thank you. Thanks, Katya. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.